in, in the past, you've you've you've, talk, you've spoken about um, tax breaks for the UK-based uh, studios and stuff, stuff, because obviously other nations have them. Why why do you why do you think that they are important? Um, I think what really is important. We have a worldwide industry. Uh, it's very easy to sell games, relatively speaking, now um, worldwide. You know that um, for one of our games, for example, China is the biggest territory, bigger than the US. And, and I think that just shows how the world has changed. And the problem is, because of that change, uh, we're competing with developers based in India, in the US, in Singapore, in Canada, you know, all around the world, in Japan. Most of the territories where games are developed now have some sort of efficient tax treatment. People call them tax breaks, but um, talking to people, for example, from the Canadian government, who, um, where we've opened an office, but they point out that, yes, they have given favourable tax treatment to people in, in our industry, but they've got way more back because it means that they base the development out there. So all the jobs go out there, and what's more, all of the, sort of the profits are eventually, hopefully, made out of there. You know, producing anything creatively, there is an element of risk. And the advantage is that the if you encourage that risk, the reward also comes to the same location. Because on average, the return is, is positive, and it's, it's, big, it's hugely positive. If you can move the way the tax moves from that risky part to the upside, that's better for everybody. Mm. And that's essentially what they're doing. You know, it's, it's similar to the, the favourable tax treatments that they give for film. Yeah. And, and, and that tends to be the case all, all around the world. You know, it, and it's now becoming so with, with games. You know, we're getting a more level playing field. What it essentially means is meant previously, and hopefully the tax breaks coming through will, will, will change it, that we were one of the few places where that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. So it, we had to be um, you know, tens of percent more profitable to break even. Right, yes. And, and that's the problem. Mm -hmm. And then the people think, you know, big worldwide publishers think, well, why do we work with people in the UK? It's, yeah. it's bonkers. Let's go and work with people in, in Montreal, in Singapore, you know, all of the other places. Many, great many US states have it as well. Because, mm. I mean, as, as, as a, somebody who's interested in, in games in the games industry, how it, we can see how important the, the games industry is to the UK economy, but, but how, is, do you think there's any way we can make it more obvious to the, to the to people in government and to the, to the rest of societies in general? Well, I think the, um, there was a study done in 2008, and there's been other ones since in 2009 and since, it's, it's where the average age of gamers, I think at the, the 2008 one was 28, but it was going up by more than a year a year. Mm. In other words, not only is the population of people who play games getting older as well mm. as new people coming in, but actually it's spreading into an older generation. Yeah. And, and I think the, the important um, thing with that is that it, there is a big cohort of the older generation, I, I particularly mean people who are my age and older, um, who weren't really brought up with games or their contact with games has been their kids who in turn have grown up playing the, the games of the very early 80s which tended to be very bleepy, very repetitive, the, the sort of games I've already been talking about. You know, um, mm. the great games but are very different to the sort of games people see today and that's their image of games mm. and so they're very very dismissive of them and um, that's certainly true in government where uh, um, only a few and they're, they're, they're great sort of um, siren voices who are, are big gamers people like Ed, Ed Vasey for example, yeah. Don Foster you know mm. um, and uh, you know th those people have been great evangelists but as a rule they're not huge gamers right. Um, you know, there was a lot, of, lot made when uh, David Cameron made comments about Angry Birds, which is great. But I think um, games are part of the, um, the cultural landscape, if you like, but very much more so at the moment amongst a younger generation. Mm -hmm. But it's moving up. And so I think that if you look at the, um, the revenue, there's a fantastic figure on the BBC um, published around Christmas time, just before New Year's where they were looking at the figures for online sales of uh, digital items. And for the first time, games exceeded TV, film, and music put together. Right. So, and but if you look at the press and if you look at the um, the way um, games are presented, you would swear it was the other way around. Yeah. You know, the games were the, the poor relation, and and I think that it, it's that sort of um, change that people are starting to see mm. that that does matter, and the fact that we we are 
um, big employers. We are a, a huge growth industry. Mm. And the growth around the world in our industry has been prodigious. The only issue is most of that growth hasn't happened in the UK right. because it's been strongly discouraged, um, particularly by um, previous governments. Yeah. Because when I think back to the early 80s, I mean, we were talking earlier about um, the original Elite, and I, and I played it on the ZX Spectrum, which was a UK developed hardware. Now, do you think, um, and then obviously the, the major platforms, I'm talking the consoles, I mean the American and Japanese with Nintendo and, and the Xbox, and, and Sony obviously with the PlayStation. Do you think the, sort of the nation sort of missed a trick and missed out because we, you know, we are, we are making the, the leading edge technology in the, sort of the games field, or do you, do you think, um, do you think this is not important? Well, um, in um, the mid 2000s, where it was still um, very high in the sort of forefront of the world, I think we were number two country for in the, the games industry. Mm. Um, and that slipped back a bit because a lot of the, it was the same people they just moved abroad right okay. uh, a lot of the same sort of senior yeah. people but if you look the, the, the technology still comes from places I mean we're on the science park in Cambridge most of the technology in these devices comes from this science park if you just really? list all of the, the people like Broadcom Qualcomm all, all of the people Arm is just down the road mm -hmm. you know that um, they make 90 plus percent of the CPUs in most mobile devices for example yeah. You know, and so many other of the um, really important technologies that are in your mobile phone or in your games console come from within a few miles of this building. Mm. Um, you know, and I, I think that is a fantastic, sort of already a fantastic centre, a fantastic hub for industry. And you look at some of the things like the um, Raspberry Pi that I'm involved in, you know, it's been a huge success world, mm. worldwide. Yeah. Um, you know, we did this as a solution to a, to a problem. Um, and, and I'm very proud, of, but it, it was doable, partly because a lot of those technologies are based in Cambridge and a lot of the knowledge behind it. Mm. I was going to come on to the Raspberry Pi. You're obviously very, very proud of it. Yeah. Um, so, what you say was to solve a problem, what was that, what, in, your, in your mind, what was that problem? Well, the, um, back in 2005 at Frontier, my sort of day job if you like, mm -hmm. um, we saw quite a drop off in applicants for computer science. Mm. So um, we would take on quite a few graduates each year, but we had far fewer graduates sort of coming, coming to us, I think it was 2005. And we thought we'd just done something to upset people somehow, or maybe our advertising wasn't working <laughs> as well. Yeah. And you know, as you do, and I asked around, I imagine other companies had the same problem. Right. And so, uh, you know, at that time, um, we were also, I was on advisory boards of various universities still are, but um, talk to them about it. And their problem was, because it all came together at much the same time, mm. was they had had a precipitous drop off of the number of applications to university. Okay. So um, according to UCAS figures, this is for the UK only by the way, um, in 2001, the number of applicants was at a peak, but it dropped off more than 50% within the next right. few years. Okay. And that was in a rising university population, mm. because that, that was a, a time of a new government that were trying to um, get more students to go to university. Yeah. So it was against that backdrop. But um, cutting a long story short, at the same time, they had mandated the teaching of ICT in schools. Right. So anecdotally, those students who were applying in 2001 to go to university were the first lot of students who had suffered ICT. Right, oh, okay. And um, because obviously we've been making games for all sorts of audiences, one of the things that um, we often do is focus tests where we test games with kids if it's a game that's aiming at kids. Mm. And a question I'd like to ask them, you know, when you do try and do something to get us a feel for the sort of things they're interested in, is what's your most boring subject at school? Right, okay. And um, sort of prior to then, they were saying a wide range of subjects, but in a sort of way, it's healthy. You know, and they're yeah. often saying yeah. maths, history, and all this sort of thing in foreign yeah. languages. But after that point, there was a time when it suddenly became ICT. Oh dear. And I thought that should be the most interesting, exciting subject. And that might mm. be partly because of my techie background, you know, that, mm -hmm. um, that I, I can see myself or a younger version of me much more interested in that. Yeah. But it was also that I see that there are so many exciting things. These same kids are huge fans of games. They play games at home. But there's a complete disconnect between that and um, getting interested in technology. So that's where I sort of set a goal 
um, for trying to raise the level of interest and to attach the fact, to realise that computer games and ICT, or rather um, computer science, are much more closely related. And when I looked to see what they were teaching in ICT, it was mm. actually really dull. Mm. They, it was really how to learn um, skills. I mean, Microsoft Office is great, but they're office-based skills that don't get kids excited. You know, no. writing letters to people, write, doing spreadsheets. PowerPoint can be vaguely exciting, but really it's <laughs> dull. Really, Let's no. face it. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And so they were completely turned off technology. And yeah. that same generation just imagined that it would, you know, they were so put off it that they didn't want to do that at university. Yeah. And that's caused a real hole within mm. the UK because we've, we've not had graduates now coming through for coming up for 10 years. Yeah. Um, and so that actually means that those graduates would gradually become senior and help recruit. So we've got a long-term problem. So the problem we set out, there were six of us, got together and we were saying, well, how do, what do we do about this, including admission tutors from um, Cambridge University. Yeah excellent people like uh, Eben Upton and Jack Lang, you know, Alan Mycroft, and they, 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 um, Robert Mullins. They, 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 we got together because to, we all cared about the problem mm. and thought, you know, we must be able to do this. So we looked at a software platform. Um, we worked with a group called Computing at School, which we just yeah. formed. And I was at their first meeting, in fact, which is here in Cambridge, where we were just saying there must be a way we can all work together and put things into the public domain to help with this problem. And I talked to government about it. And the government response was, in my view, shocking. Right. Really, really negative. Yeah. Because they thought they thought I was special pleading for the games industry, which I wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, I pointed out this was actually STEM subjects. It's not just yeah. um, computer science, but computer science was probably the more acute at that time, at least from my sure. admittedly slightly narrow perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, look, this is going to be a real problem for the country. And she said, oh, don't worry, we're teaching computers and was very dismissive about it. Yeah. And I think the government view was that ICT was teaching computers, when actually what had happened is there are quite a few excellent schools that had previously been teaching computer science, but because ICT was mandated, it used up the same slots, lesson slots. So they stopped teaching computer science, which is a real shame, because that can really motivate kids. You know, anything from building little robots to, yeah. to programming. And programming can be exciting. If you say programming now, to a kid, they assume it's like sort of web developer type stuff and they will turn off. If you say, would you like to make an app, they get all excited. Yes. So it's all one a case of vocabulary and the programming vocabulary has now got damaged. Yeah. So we set about and we, after quite a long time, we said, well, why don't we make a hardware platform? Between us, there's enough knowledge to do this mm -hmm. and to, to evangelize it. And we talked to the BBC. Um, we thought we'd create something called the BBC Nano. Right, yeah. Okay. Just because of the, I mean, I had an Acorn Atom and then a BBC Micro and you know, there's a lot of sort of great nostalgia and positivity yeah, over yeah. it. Uh, and I thought that would make people smile. It would yeah. make our generation smile and the kids would go, oh, no, no, that sounds cool. You know, yeah. it sounds like a little iPod thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but they were very cool. They just said, oh, we don't want to back one manufacturer over right, another okay. and all this. Yeah, yeah. Said, well, look, we're a registered charity, you know. So we then, that route went cold. But to be honest, we met some great people at the BBC who thought it was such a good idea, they really helped us, people like Rory Kettle and Jones, mm -hmm. um, and helped us evangelize it you know, when, the, when the time came. Um, so then it was the Raspberry Pi. We were already called the Raspberry Pi Foundation at the point we went to the BBC, but um, we decided we'd go it alone, and you know, how hard can it be? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we, we funded, um, between us, uh, a run of, I think it was 10,000. Because one of the things people don't realize is for hardware, it takes a long time to make it. Yes. Because you've got to order the components a long time in advance and you've got to find a factory and all this mm -hmm, thing. Mm -hmm. And we said, right, we're going to make 10,000. And we started the, I started the publicity engine, if you like, and we um, and started talking about it. And we had a website, we set up a website, and we, we saw this sort of unbelievable tidal wave of interest coming towards us. Because I, I think the first thing, it was um, of the hundreds of thousands, I don't remember the exact figure, who registered interest mm. and a fantastic uh, Liz Upton looking after the site and all of the thing was we, we were overwhelmed with interest and um, so we then sort of did a slight change of plan where we, we spoke to um, um, really helpful and supportive uh, distribution um, companies mm -hmm. so uh, um, Premier, Premier Varnell and uh, RS Electronics mm -hmm. um, both agreed to manufacture and we put a deal in place 
But unfortunately, we'd the, the pipeline we were starting to evangelise was the one that we'd filled with 10,000 units. Right, okay. And it's when they came on board, <coughs> then the additional huge capacity, which is, is what we needed, was there. But mm-hmm. then that took quite a while to, to, kick, in. to kick, kick, kick in. So on the 29th of February, I appeared on various, you know, BBC Worldwide and all this thing. Okay. Which was set up earlier. Yeah. But then it was one of those things where you think, hmm, I think that was probably overkill <laughs> for 10,000 units. Because we thought, we, this was a developer device. Yeah. We were going to have the educational device later. But the, 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 the point with that was, and I think it was within a fraction of a second or seconds, mm. we don't know because the site went down. Because right, we, okay. we started taking orders at 6 a.m. Mm-hmm. And by 6.02 or something, they'd all gone, the 10,000 right. that we'd already made. Okay. Uh, and then those poor people had to wait quite a time for those orders to be fulfilled. But the real problem was it then even exceeded the capacity that Farnell and RS right. by a big margin. Yeah. And so we didn't catch up the backlog until late summer, where mm. we had already put in a lot of extra capacity. Yeah. And we also put in extra capacity here in the UK. This is one of the other things that um, that we fought for. And I'm, I'm really proud that we managed to do it, which is using... Uh, um, Sony's factory in Wales oh, right. to manufacture in the UK. That's brilliant. So it's actually made it, the Raspberry Pis you're getting now are made in the UK, which I think is great. And you must be pleased at the way that the, there's a whole community that's built up around it, that people doing different things, creating their own versions of the of the uh, Raspbian OS that's on it and doing all sorts of crazy stuff. I think that's absolutely fantastic. And seeing things like BBC Basic on Raspberry Pi and there are all sorts of wacky projects. I think we. Um, may well be the highest personal computer. Right, okay. Because some, a guy um, did a, put, put a balloon up with a camera and a Raspberry Pi in it, mm. to, running a sort of a remote point of presence to, so you could connect to it. And it went up to 100 and something thousand feet. And the only things that go higher than that are going to be things like the, the rockets and the space shuttle, sure. which are, are much more sort of military hardened computers. Mm. Now, there are probably things that have gone up higher, but. You know, it's, it's got a chance of being yeah, biased. Yeah, it's, 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 a good, it's a good claim to fame.